Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you've never seen my face before, then hi, my name is Molly. And I post true crime videos like this every single week, so if you think that is something that you might want to stick around for, then please do subscribe. And don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that YouTube will let you know whenever I post a new video. But anyway, this week we are going to be talking about a case that that remained unsolved for more than 30 years. The detectives investigating this inquiry had a suspect, but they struggled to find any concrete evidence linking them to the crime. But then eventually, the evidence they so desperately needed was discovered, and the killer was convicted of murder for a second time. There was more than one victim in this case. But before we get into the case, I would just like to say a huge thank you to Babbel for kindly sponsoring this section of the video. If you've never heard of Babbel before, it is a language learning app. In my opinion, the best language learning app on the market with millions of active subscribers. One thing that's been on my bucket list, I guess, for literally years now is to learn a new language because I'm always so impressed when people tell me that they're fluent in a language that isn't their first language. And I want to be one of those impressive people, but I would just constantly put off actually getting around to it because learning a new language is something that just always seemed so daunting and difficult. That was until I started using Babbel. At the moment I'm using it to learn French and I'm currently on my third lesson of course number two. Babbel is proven to get you speaking a new language in just three weeks and the thing I love about it is the fact that the classes are short and fun. So it makes learning a new language really enjoyable and not boring at all. They'll teach you through reading, listening, writing and speaking tasks but also through fun little games and podcasts and they also have the thing called Babbel Live where you can join online classes with expert teachers in small groups so you can learn alongside other people that are studying the same language you are. The lessons and classes on Babbel are created by over 150 real language teachers and university studies have actually shown that 15 hours of learning on Babbel equals a whole semester or term of learning at college, which is incredible considering it doesn't feel like you are actually doing work. As I said, Babbel makes the experience of learning a new language so fun. I truly could not recommend Babbel enough. So if you would like to learn French like me or German or Spanish or Italian or another language, there are so many that you can learn on Babbel. Then head to the link down below in my description box because they are currently offering you guys the amazing deal of up to 65% off your Babbel subscription. Once again, a huge thank you to Babbel for sponsoring this video and supporting the channel. It really does mean so much. And now let's just get into the case. So for today's case, we are going all the way back to the year 1981 in Windsor, which is a town in Berkshire in the southeast of England. Of course, Windsor is mostly famous for its Windsor Castle, which is one of the many residences of the royal family. And so for that reason, the town of Windsor is often very busy. A lot of tourists like to go there and explore. But the people that actually live there say it is a lovely place to live. It's one of those places where all of the locals are very familiar with each other and everyone knows everyone else's business. However, in August of 1981, the town of Windsor was completely shaken up when a random and brutal murder occurred, a murder that would haunt the area and remain unsolved for more than three decades. It was the morning of Friday the 28th of August 1981 when Detective Superintendent Kenneth Linney of the Thames Valley Police received a phone call alerting him that a dead body had been found on a towpath in Barry Avenue on the bank of the River Thames in Windsor. The body had been initially discovered by a man who was on his way to work that morning and he contacted the police straight away and by 6 45 a.m detective Kenneth Linney was at the scene and immediately he could tell that this person had not died of natural causes. It was very obvious that foul play 
was involved here. The body found was that of a teenage girl. She was naked and lying face down on the ground and whoever had done this, whoever had dumped her body, had made no attempt whatsoever to hide her. She was just on a public towpath for all to see. So the area was obviously cornered off by the police as it was now a crime scene and an investigation immediately began to try and determine what exactly had happened to this young girl. One of the very first things the police did as soon as the body was discovered was they immediately ordered all of the houseboats that were in the River Thames close to the body to stop. Obviously it seemed as though this body had been dumped next to the Thames during the previous night. So the police were thinking that maybe one of the occupants of these houseboats had seen or heard something. So they started interviewing and taking statements from all of the houseboat occupants. However, unfortunately, it didn't appear as though any of them had any information relating to this. None of them had seen or heard anything. Following this, the detectives got to work on trying to determine who this young girl was. Although they quickly realized realised that no young girl had been recently reported as missing in the Windsor area so it seemed as though identifying her was going to be difficult. But what had happened to her? How had she died and how did she end up on a towpath next to the River Thames? The pathologist that attended the scene whilst the body was still there was able to determine that this young girl's throat had been cut, had been slashed and this was her cause of death. So this was a very very brutal and vicious attack. Her body had also been mutilated and additionally she had been sexually assaulted by her killer. However they were able to determine that the girl probably hadn't been killed where her body was found because from what I can gather there wasn't much blood at all at the scene. So it seemed as though the attack had taken place elsewhere and then she was either unconscious or she was already dead when she was dumped on the towpath. Before the body was moved from the scene, a forensic team began a procedure called taping, which is basically where they get sellotape and use it to pick up any fibres or particles that are present on the body. And then after this, they would just seal the tapes in like an evidence bag and store them. This is something that was commonly done around the early 1980s because obviously back then they didn't have the kind of DNA and forensic technology technology that we have now. So they would store these tapings that were taken from the body in the hopes that in the future when there are more advances in forensic science they can be tested and they might result in a lead or even the identity of the perpetrator. So they took these tapings from the young girl's body and the investigation into trying to find out who this victim was continued. Meanwhile word of a body being found in Windsor had spread like wildfire. It wasn't long before it was national news. Everyone knew about it, everyone was talking about it and that was when a woman called Carol Waterton who lived about 13 miles away near Hanwell in West London became very very concerned. She had heard on the radio that a young girl's body had been found and immediately alarm bells started to ring because her daughter never arrived home the previous night. Her daughter was called Claire Waterton. She was 17 years old and on the morning of the 28th of August 1981, so the same morning that the body was found in Windsor, Carol went to her daughter Claire's bedroom to wake her up and she wasn't there and her bed hadn't been slept in and Carol just knew in that moment when Claire wasn't in her bed, she just knew that something wasn't right. But anyway, Carol went to work that morning as usual and that was when she heard on the radio that a body had been found and Carol says that as soon as she heard that news on the radio she knew instantly that it was Claire. It was like mother's intuition. She just had such a strong feeling that the body that was found was her daughter. Carol immediately began ringing around all of Claire's friends just to check if any of them had seen Claire or if they had heard anything from her and they hadn't and she also contacted Claire's 
work. I'm not exactly sure where Claire worked, but she was due to go in for a shift that morning, I believe. And when Carol contacted the people that she worked with, they told her that Claire never showed up. And it was at this point that Carol decided to go to the police station to report her daughter as missing. And after the police looked at pictures of Claire, they could confirm that the body found in Windsor was in fact 17 year old Claire Waterton and they had to break the awful news of her horrific death to her family. But before we go any further with the case, let me just tell you a little bit more about Claire, about her life and the kind of person that she was. So as I've said, Claire's mother was called Carol Waterton, her stepfather was called Terry and Claire was one of three siblings. She had two brothers who I think were both older and their names were Nick and Philip. Claire was described as being a very hardworking and kind young girl who had a great sense of humour. Claire's mother says that some of her favourite memories of Claire are just of her making everyone in the family laugh at the dinner table. When they were sat down having a meal, Claire would just do silly things to make people laugh, like she would stuff peas up her nose or she would have ice cream all over her face. She was the kind of person that was always happy to help others anybody that needed anything, needed assistance with anything, she would be the first to offer her help. She did whatever she could for other people to make other people happy. Claire was also a very popular teenager. She had a lot of friends who she loved spending time with. Her mother Carol said that Claire would always have friends around the house. Their house would always be full of her friends because she was a very social person. Claire was just a bright, happy-go-lucky, lovely young girl. She was so very precious to her family. She really meant a lot to them and she was in the prime of her life with so much to look forward to until her life was tragically cut short in August of 1981. So as soon as the body found in Windsor was identified as Claire, the hunt was on to find her killer. A major incident room was set up as the kind of hub of the inquiry and the first thing the police needed to do was piece together Claire's last known movements and work out how she ended up 13 miles away from her hometown. The evening before her body was found, so the 27th of August 1981, Claire was just at home, she was doing some ironing and her mother Carol asked her what her plans were that night. Was she going out anywhere? To which Claire replied, no, she planned on staying home. However, she must have changed her mind because when her family returned home from wherever they had gone that evening, Claire wasn't in the house. She had gone out in the end, which wasn't a problem to her parents. Claire was 17 years old and she was a responsible and independent girl who knew to always be home by 10pm. That was her curfew. However, it got to around 11pm and Claire still hadn't returned. Her mother Carol eventually went to bed, although she just could not get to sleep because Claire wasn't home yet and she couldn't settle until she knew that she was home. But then at one point she heard some laughter coming from outside of the house and she assumed that it was Claire. She thought that she was back safe and sound and she went to sleep. But it wasn't Claire. Claire never returned home that night and as we know the next morning she was found dead. But then where did Claire go the previous night when she left the house? That was what the police needed to find out. Well it was soon discovered that that Thursday evening Claire had gone to visit her boyfriend on Uxbridge Road in Ealing because he was working there that night at an amusement arcade. So Claire went to the arcade to see her boyfriend although they actually ended up having a little disagreement about something while she was there and so she left the arcade at 10pm to go back home. Now normally her boyfriend would have driven Claire back to her house but because of this disagreement that they had I think Claire just got frustrated and she decided to walk back home alone. So she started the journey home but her boyfriend drove after her and he tried to persuade her to get into his car because he didn't want her walking home so late at night on her own. However Claire was having none of it. She refused the lift and so the boyfriend went back to his house and Claire carried on walking and that was the last time anyone saw Claire alive. When the police spoke to Claire's boyfriend that was obviously his version of events from 
that night, although he was immediately treated as a suspect in this inquiry because he had admitted that he and Claire had a bit of an argument on the night that she was killed. So he was actually arrested on suspicion of her murder and taken in for a questioning. But the boyfriend was not a suspect for very long because when the police began looking into his movements from that night, they were able to confirm that he had gone straight back to his home after Claire walked away. And a neighbour of his was able to tell the police that shortly after this, they saw him walking his dog alone. He had a concrete alibi, so the police were soon able to rule him out as being Claire's killer. After her boyfriend was eliminated from the inquiry, the police made the decision to release the information about Claire's movements on the night that she was killed to the press and the public. They were hoping that someone would remember having seen Claire or just anything suspicious and they would come forward with information and soon enough two women did. These two women said that they actually remembered seeing a young girl getting dragged into a car not too long after Claire was last seen and this happened at a junction by Uxbridge Road and Yedding Lane. Unfortunately the two women couldn't be certain about what kind of car this young girl was dragged into. They couldn't even say for sure what colour it was. All they really told the police was that they believed it was a dark coloured car. However, the police really needed more information than that. This was pretty much their only lead and they were thinking that this young girl being dragged into the car was probably Claire. And so they knew that they needed to find that car. If they can find the car, then they can find the person that owns it and that person would possibly have been Claire's murderer. And so the police actually took these two witnesses, the two women, to see some hypnotists as they were hoping that might result in them remembering some more details about this incident. Maybe they would remember the number plate or maybe they would be able to describe the person that dragged the girl into the car, give a description of what they looked like. However, unfortunately, these sessions with the hypnotist did not offer up any new information. They couldn't give any more details about this incident than they originally gave and the police were unable to trace this vehicle. And I think eventually the police started to doubt that this sighting was of Claire being dragged into a car because the two women were very vague about it and apparently they were standing quite far away from where it happened so it wasn't like it happened right in front of them. They said the girl didn't scream or anything like that so the police began thinking that maybe what actually happened wasn't what the women had described. Like maybe the two women thought the young girl was being dragged into the car but because they were quite far away from where it happened perhaps they just misunderstood the situation. Maybe the girl wasn't being dragged into the car but it just looked that way from where they were standing if you know what I mean. Basically there was no concrete evidence to suggest that this was what really happened. I don't believe anyone else came forward to say that they had seen this incident too. So the police couldn't be sure that this incident was related to this inquiry but it was still a potential lead that could be looked into later regardless. And so the investigation continued and meanwhile as the car lead was being looked into other officers were conducting door-to-door -door inquiries. They were knocking on the doors of pretty much every single home between where Claire was last seen and her house because obviously she was abducted and killed somewhere along her route Home. So they were conducting door-to-door -door inquiries and on top of that the detectives were also looking into previous criminals that had a history of sexual assault convictions and that now lived in and around the area of where Claire went missing just in case they may have had anything to do with her murder. The detectives were really working tirelessly on this case. I mean some days they were doing like 14 hour shifts because they were just working so incredibly hard. They they were investigating every single tip and lead and every single line of inquiry because they were so desperate to find Claire's killer. Not just because they wanted justice and answers for her family, but also because Claire's murder was so horrific, so brutal and clearly sexually motivated. So there was a high chance that whoever had done this would do it again to another young girl. But sadly, their tireless efforts did not end with the result 
results they had hoped for because after months of investigation they still had nothing. Despite all of the press attention Claire's case had received and despite numerous people coming forward with potential tips and leads they still had no idea who Claire's killer was and soon months turned into years and this case gradually just started to go cold. I think people really started to lose hope that it would ever be solved. But then just over three years after Claire's murder in late 1984, Detective Superintendent Kenneth Linney received a phone call from police officers that worked in Denham, which is a village in Buckingham that is not too far from Windsor where Claire's body was found. It's about 10 miles away. Anyway, he received a phone call from officers in Denham because they had just had a murder occur in their area. A murder that was very similar to Claire Waterton's case and so for that reason they thought that the two might have been linked. In December of 1984 the dead body of another young woman was discovered on a golf course in Denham. She had been beaten around the head, she had been mutilated and I believe also sexually assaulted and then her naked body was just dumped in a public area. Again similar to Claire's murder the killer had made no attempt to conceal the body. She was just dumped on a golf course on full display for everyone to see. This victim was eventually identified as being 28 year old Deirdre Sainsbury who was originally from Greenham in Berkshire in England and it didn't take long for the police to identify a suspect in Deirdre's case. When a murder investigation was launched and the police appealed to the public and released details about Deirdre's murder, a man actually came forward with information. This man remembered seeing a woman that he believed to be Deirdre on the day that she disappeared. She was getting into a car on the South Circular Road in Richmond, which is roughly 20 miles away from the golf course in Denham where her body was later found. Now it was discovered that on the day Deirdre went missing, she had actually been hitchhiking and the man that saw Deirdre getting into the car remembered having recently read an article about the dangers of hitchhiking and how hitchhikers are often picked up by complete strangers and so when he saw Deirdre a hitchhiker getting into a car he decided to jot down the license plate just in case something happened to this hitchhiker and then when this man heard about the murder of Deirdre Sainsbury he went straight to the police told them about what he had seen and he handed over the license plate of the car that he saw Deirdre getting into so the police looked into the license plate and they found that the owner of this car was a man named Colin Campbell. He was around 37 years old by this time in 1984. He worked as a travelling salesman and I believe he lived in an area called Acton which is in West London. And now he was the main suspect in the murder of Deirdre Sainsbury because it was his car that had been seen picking her up on the day that she went missing. So the police went to Colin Campbell's home to speak with him and also to search his car and his property to see if they could find any evidence linking him to Deirdre Sainsbury and sure enough they did. In his garage they discovered Deirdre's clothing, the clothes that she was wearing on the day that she vanished but that were removed from her body before she was found on the golf course and so of course Colin Campbell was immediately arrested on suspicion of murder and he was taken into the police station for questioning and let's be honest he couldn't really deny his involvement because her clothes had literally been found on his property. There is no way that he could have had her clothes if he wasn't her killer and he knew that so he admitted that he was responsible for her death. Colin Campbell's story was that on the day that Deirdre died he was driving in his car when he came across her hitchhiking and so he decided to stop and offer her a lift which it seems as though she accepted and she willingly got into his vehicle. He said that the two of them began chatting in the car. They 
they exchanged names he told her that his name was Colin and it seemed as though they were getting along really well and because they were getting on really well Colin decided that he was going to try it on with Deirdre so he began flirting with her and I think he may have tried to kiss her however she clearly wasn't interested because according to Colin she then hit him and so he retaliated and he hit her back although he says that he hit her so hard that she actually fell unconscious and it was at this point that Colin really started to panic because he realized that he had told Deirdre his name so if she went to the police about this he would easily be identified and he'd probably be arrested for assault and apparently he couldn't risk that happening so he decided to silence her by finishing her off essentially by killing her he went to the back of his car grabbed a hockey stick that he he kept in his car because he played hockey a lot and then he hit Deirdre repeatedly with this hockey stick until he was sure that she was dead. However, if you remember from earlier, when Deirdre's body was found, it was determined that she had a lot more injuries than that. She had been beaten around the head, but it was also discovered that her body had been mutilated. And when Colin Campbell was asked about the mutilation, he admitted that he had done that too, but only to, and I quote, make it look like a maniac had done it. But as we know, Claire Waterton's body was also mutilated by her killer. Like I said, there were quite a few similarities between these two cases. They both had different causes of death. Claire's throat had been slashed, whereas Deirdre was beaten around the head. But apart from that, their cases were pretty much identical. They were both young women that were abducted whilst they were walking alone. They were both mutilated. They were both sexually assaulted. They were both naked when they were found and then they were both dumped in a public place. So naturally the police investigating Deirdre's case began thinking that maybe this wasn't the first time that Colin Campbell had killed. Maybe Claire Waterton was his first victim. And so as we know they decided to get in touch with Detective Superintendent Kenneth Linney to make him aware of this potential connection. As soon as Detective Linney received this news he went straight straight to Denham to speak to Colin Campbell about the murder of Claire. And Colin was apparently very cooperative with the police. He was willing to answer any questions. He said that he had been to Windsor before. However, he claimed that he had nothing to do with Claire's case. He said that he was not her murderer. And so the police went to search his property again to see if they could find anything there that linked him to Claire's case, just like with Deirdre. But unfortunately, they did not find a single thing. There was no evidence to concretely say that Colin was Claire's murderer and so they couldn't do anything. They couldn't charge him. But the detectives involved in Deirdre's case could go forward with their inquiry and they did charge him. They charged him with Deirdre's murder. Although when the case went to court, Campbell actually made the decision to plead not guilty to the crime despite literally confessing. He admitted that yes, he was the one who ended Deirdre's life, but he claimed that he couldn't be held responsible because he killed her whilst he was suffering an epileptic episode and so for that reason he said that he should be convicted of manslaughter and not murder. However the jury were not convinced. They did not believe that an epileptic episode could have caused this brutal and vicious and sexually motivated crime and therefore in the summer of 1985 he was found guilty of the murder of 29 year old Deirdre Sainsbury and he was sentenced to life imprisonment. So thankfully Deirdre had received some justice for her death but what about Claire? Her murder was still officially in the eyes of the law unsolved however the detectives were so sure that Colin was her killer. Their cases just seemed way too similar for them not to have been committed by the same person but as I said the police couldn't do anything they couldn't charge him without any evidence connecting him to Claire. Now jumping forward a bit to the year 1990 
1996. So this was 15 years after Campbell was sent to prison for Deirdre's murder. 15 years into his sentence, Colin actually decided to appeal his conviction. Again, he was stating that he could not be held responsible for murder because he claimed that he had suffered an epileptic episode during Deirdre's death. However, this time in 1996, he had the opinion of an expert on his side. During his appeal, this expert said that an epileptic episode could have been to blame for Campbell's violent outburst if he was on the wrong medication for his epilepsy at the time, which Campbell said that he was. And unbelievably, this appeal worked because Campbell's conviction was quashed and a retrial was ordered in 1999. For a second time, Campbell pleaded not guilty to murder and instead pleaded guilty to the manslaughter of Deirdre Sainsbury. And he was convicted of that, convicted of manslaughter, which was obviously what he wanted. He wanted to be convicted of manslaughter. But to his dismay, he was still sentenced to life in prison because even though the court accepted that he may have been suffering an epileptic episode at the time of Deirdre's death, they said that he was still a danger to the public, still a danger to other young women. So they said that he wouldn't be considered for release until he had gone through a parole hearing. And when his case did go to a parole board, they decided that he wouldn't be released yet because of the threat that he posed. And so Campbell remained remained in prison for the time being and in the meantime the inquiry into Claire's murder was still being investigated. Naturally by this time obviously it was years and years later so the investigation did slow down. They never fully closed the case, they would still look into every tip and lead they received but as time went on of course other newer investigations required a lot of the police's time and attention but Detective Linney and his team were still so determined to bring Claire's killer to justice, whether that was really Colin Campbell or someone else that they just hadn't identified yet. By the year 2011, so 30 years after Claire's murder, it was still officially unsolved in the eyes of the law. No one had ever been convicted or even charged with her brutal killing. But in recent years, the Thames Valley Police have been looking into various different cold cases and in 2011, they began a review into Claire's case, which was led by principal investigator Peter Byrne. Peter Byrne was hopeful that the advancements they now had in DNA and forensic technology would result in a breakthrough in the case. Because like we talked about earlier, back in 1981, when Claire was discovered on the towpath by the River Thames, the forensic team took some tapings from her body. They used sellotape to pick up any potential fibres or DNA particles and then these tapings were sealed and kept in storage because back then in the early 80s they didn't have the forensic technology to be able to conduct tests on them. But now in 2011 DNA and forensic science had come a very long way so maybe scientists would be able to find something on these tapings that would lead investigators to the identity of Claire's attacker. So the these tapings were sent over to LGC Forensics in Oxford so that they could conduct tests and be microscopically examined. And sure enough, scientists found something. On these tapings, they found a mixed DNA profile. So two people's DNA mixed together. The first DNA profile was of the victim, Claire Waterton, and the second DNA profile was of an unknown male this was her killer's DNA. So this unknown male's DNA profile was submitted into the National DNA Database, which identified a couple of potential contributors of the DNA, and Colin Campbell was one of them. The man that had been the main suspect in the investigation for years and years he had flagged up as a match to the DNA they now had of Claire's killer. So of course the detectives were overjoyed. They had always been so, so sure that Campbell was the perpetrator and they thought that finally, after all this time, they'd be able to convict this guy of Claire's murder. However, they faced a bit of a problem when scientists informed them that the chances of it being anyone else's DNA on Claire's body and not Colin Campbell's 
was one in a million. Now one in a million is obviously still a pretty strong uh, match, a strong indicator that Campbell was the killer. Whilst that is good evidence, the police were concerned that one in a million wasn't solid enough, wasn't strong enough to convict him of murder because there's over 60 million people in the UK. So there could be around 60 other people in the country that the DNA could belong to because it was one in a million. They needed it to be stronger than that because if it went to trial then the whole case, the whole prosecution's case would rely solely on the forensic evidence because that was really all the evidence they had. So they decided that they were going to keep working on the forensic evidence and the tapings from Claire's body before they went forward with a charge. Now in the meantime as all of this was going on Colin Campbell who was around 64 years old he was still in prison however he was actually a category D prisoner which basically meant that he was in an open prison so he was given access to the open essentially I believe he was allowed out into the public like five days a month by this point he had been in prison for the murder or the manslaughter now of Deirdre Sainsbury for 26 years and he was kind of coming to the end of his sentence he was probably going to be let out pretty soon so he was being prepared for going back into the real world so that's why he was a category d prisoner although now that the detectives working on claire's case had some evidence linking him to the crime his privileges were revoked he was no longer allowed to go out a couple of days a month because he was a danger to the public they had potentially connected him to a second murder now so he was recategorized he was no longer in category d and he was sent back to a closed prison and then just a couple of months later the detectives received the news they had been waiting for there had been a development with the forensic evidence the tapings that were taken from claire's body were sent to a professor of genetic statistics from ucl college in london and he conducted some tests on the samples he had been sent and in his expert opinion, the chances of the DNA profile on these tapings belonging to anyone other than Colin Campbell was one in a billion. Before it was one in a million and now it was one in a billion and that was it. That was the solid concrete evidence the police needed to take this man to trial. One in a billion was an identification to Colin Campbell. On the 27th of November 2012, Campbell was arrested on suspicion of the murder of 17-year-old Claire Waterton and the police brought him in for a questioning. Campbell didn't display any remorse in his interview with the police. Apparently he seemed to think of himself as the victim in all of this. He denied ever knowing Claire. Well, he said that he didn't remember her. He didn't recognise her. If I can, I'll try and include some of the footage from his interview, although I don't know if I'll be able to for copyright reasons. My lifestyle meant that the way I was, um, I wasn't averse to, to um, being friendly with the lady. Yeah. Um, I may well have known a series of ladies. Okay. Claire may have been one of them. No, I don't. She looks like any girl I may have played hockey with. She looks like any girl I may have met through work. Okay. Actually, she, she looks like a happy person, and, and I'm glad about that. Uh, no, I don't think about Okay. Thank you very much. That's not to say I never ever knew her. I just don't remember her. He basically just said that he didn't remember having ever met Claire and so he denied killing her all those years ago in 1981. But regardless, they still had the forensic evidence linking him to the crime and so he was charged with murder. His trial began on the 15th of November 2013 and Campbell decided to plead not guilty to the charges. However, this time he couldn't try to use the defence that his 
is epilepsy and being on the wrong medication for epilepsy could have been to blame because the expert that had given evidence in his defence during his second trial for the manslaughter of Deirdre Sainsbury, they were not willing to do it again because they did not believe that his epilepsy could have been responsible for two murders. So he didn't have that defence argument now. He didn't have an expert willing to back him up. During the trial, the prosecution ran through the evidence they had linking Colin to the murder. So that was his DNA that was found on the tapings that were taken from Claire's body. And like I said, that was solid evidence against him. How else could his DNA have been on Claire Waterton when her body was found if he wasn't the killer? Well, Colin Campbell did try to come up with an explanation for this, a reason why his DNA might have been on Claire. His defence during the trial was that although he couldn't actually remember Claire and although he couldn't remember what he was doing on the evening of her death, he said that he may have been to the amusement arcade that Claire was in that night when she was visiting her boyfriend. He couldn't recall having ever gone to this specific arcade but he said that he may have that night and when he did maybe he spoke to Claire or maybe he touched her or brushed past her. Maybe he accidentally bumped into her and that was how his DNA transferred onto her body. However no one believed this for a second because and I haven't mentioned this yet but the DNA they found of Colin from Claire's body was actually discovered on the tapings from Claire's buttocks. He was claiming that his DNA being on her was innocent. It was just a transfer from both of them being in the arcade. But this evidence proves that he had touched her naked body. As we know, Claire was sexually assaulted and stripped naked on the night that she was killed. And how else could his DNA have been on her buttocks if he wasn't the one who did that to her? No one believed that there had been just innocent contact between him and Claire. And this included the jury. At the end of the trial they were sent off to deliberate and after three days of deliberation they returned with a verdict. In December of 2013, over 32 years after the crime, 66 year old Colin Campbell was found guilty of the murder of 17 year old Claire Waterton. He was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum of 24 years which is where he still remains today and will most likely remain for the rest of his life. Obviously he was 66 when he was sentenced so at the earliest he will be 90 when he is considered for parole. That's if he even makes it to 90. No one knows for sure what exactly happened on the night that Claire lost her life. We don't know how she encountered Colin Campbell. We don't know how he managed to abduct her. We don't know where exactly she was killed. There are still a lot of unanswered questions around in this case because of course the only person still alive that can tell us the truth is Colin Campbell and he is not likely to do that after all these years. But at least finally Claire's family has received some justice for her death. It's just such a shame that it took so so long. I've actually got a statement from Claire's family here which they released after the verdict and they said quote we welcome the fact that justice has now been served and Claire's murderer has been identified and sentenced after more than 30 years. However, this doesn't bring Claire back to us or in any way compensate Colin Campbell's cruel act. Claire's murder had a shocking and distressing permanent effect on our lives. We have been emotionally scarred for life and have a very cynical outlook to life now. Claire was a precious young teenager in the prime of her life with everything to look forward to. She was only 17 years of age, a lovely, bright, hard-working girl who was very popular with friends, showing a great sense of humour and kindness in helping others. Claire went out to meet some friends and never came home. We never had the chance to say goodbye. Colin Campbell is an evil and wicked individual. He destroyed Claire's hopes, Claire's dream and Claire's life. He murdered Claire in the most cold-hearted, brutal fashion and has exhibited no remorse for the act he committed. You don't get over something like this. You have to learn to live with it and we have no choice. 
police. We would like to thank the Thames Valley Police Major Crime Review Team, the Crown Prosecution Service and the Prosecution QC Peter Wright and his team for their enormous effort in bringing the murderer to trial and to face the consequences of his horrific act. So that is it for this case. That is the case of 17-year-old Claire Waterton and also 29-year-old Deirdre Sainsbury. As upsetting as this story is, I really love sharing these kind of cases with you guys because it makes me so, so happy to see cases that have been cold for years and years finally solved. I think it gives hope to other cold cases that are still waiting for justice to be served. As always, please do let me know your thoughts and opinions on this case in the comments. Also let me know of other cases that you would like to see me cover on this channel. I do have a case request form linked down below. Before I go, I do just want to say a massive thank you once again to Babbel for sponsoring this video. A reminder that when you click the link in my description box, you can receive up to 65% off your Babbel subscription. But yeah, thank you all so much for watching. Please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you again next week for another mystery with Molly. Bye guys.